Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our class on Christology. Uh, today, we'll continue studying the last chapter, chapter 13, on the Son of God. Um, last class on Tuesday, we began a study of this uh, final chapter. Uh, we were diving deeper into the identity of the Son of God. And um, and I like I said last class, our approach will be unique and a little different. Um, we'll basically transcend the confines of our temporal and our spatial reality and venture into the eternal realms to explore uh, the Son of God from a very different perspective. So we will move out of our time and space and move into the eternal realms and um, discover who this God is or know who this God is as revealed in the scripture. So we will be looking at uh, the Son of God from a very uh, different perspective. <coughs> And our journey will take us just beyond the bounds of time itself, back to the moments uh, preceding the beginning of creation. And we will try, try to grasp the profound truths uh, revealed in scripture about God before time began. Who is this God that we worship? Who is this God who we know? Who is this God who created uh, the universe? And what was God doing before the beginning of time? Or what was God doing before uh, the foundations of this world even was established? Or he spoke into the dark spaces and he created everything. Before that, what does scripture reveal to us about this God? And also we will look at, uh, we were looking at what God did before uh, the beginning. What are the remarkable deeds uh, that the eternal I am accomplished even before the unfolding of time, even before the foundations of the world was laid. So we uh, looked at uh, these two aspects. We, we looked at who this God is. Um, uh, we explored this, uh, uh, who God was even before time began. And we also looked at what the eternal I am accomplished even before the unfolding of uh, time. And so we look at now uh, the beginning, how God began to unfold in history, in our time and space, everything that he had already conceived, everything that he had already planned uh, in his mind. Uh, so the plan of the ages, that was already conceived and completed in the mind of God even before uh, the beginning. Everything was completed, everything was done, then came the beginning. So we'll see how God uh, brought about everything and uh, with, uh, you know, uh, 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 not in, in, in a general perspective, we'll not be looking at entire scripture, but, you know, uh, keeping to uh, the lesson about the Son of God. In that perspective, we will be studying about what God accomplished um, in the beginning, that he, which he had already planned in the ages, that that was already conceived and completed in the mind of God even before the beginning. Okay, so we'll begin today. And before that, can I ask one of you to please uh, lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for this time of study. We pray, Lord, that you will minister to us through your word, Father. And as you guide us, Father, we just pray that whatever we learn today, we will be able to apply the same in our lives, Father, and retain whatever we learn, Lord. We also pray, Lord, for a blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here in the Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So in the beginning, what did God do? The Godhead spoke uh, the worlds into existence. Uh, so one of you can read Psalm chapter 33, verses 6 and 9. Someone else can read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, please. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. And someone else can read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3.
Psalm 33 verse 9. 6 and 9. Sorry, 6 and 9. Truly I am as your focus man before God. I also have been formed out of clay. Verse 9. I am pure without transaction and I am innocent. I am there is no iniquity in me. Uh, did you read Psalm 33 verses 6 and 9? Psalm chapter 33 verse 6 and 9. Psalm chapter 33, verse 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord, the heaven were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that how did God made uh, how did God make the heavens and the earth? He through His word, uh, He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Hebrews eleven verse three. Can someone read that, please? By faith we understand that the world that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. So the world was created or framed by the word of God. So here we see in the beginning uh, at creation, the triune God worked together in creation. Uh, what was conceived in the Godhead, the Son spoke it and the Holy Spirit brought all that we see into existence. So it's the Father, the Word and the Spirit that worked together in creation. Okay, we also uh, uh, read in John chapter one verse three, Colossians chapter one verses sixteen and seventeen. I'm not asking you to read that because we've read that a couple of times uh, in the past lessons. In John chapter one verse three, we uh, we've read or we know that you know all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. And verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Look at what Psalm 104, verse 30 says. Can somebody read that, please? Psalm 104, verse 30. Psalm 104, verse 30. You sent forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Amen. So thank you, Sanjay. So here we see that, you know, it's the uh, what was conceived in the heart and mind of the Godhead even before creation. Uh, uh, you know, the sun spoke it, and here we see that the Holy Spirit brought them into uh, existence. So we see in creation uh, the invisible attributes of God. So the, the creation uh, reveals to us the invisible attributes of uh, God. Just as uh, the work of an art is an expression of an artist, you know, uh, or it's the display of the skill uh, uh, of an artist, or if you listen to a music piece, if you listen to a music rendering, uh, 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 if you listen to uh, uh, someone singing a song, uh, you listen to worship songs, uh, we know that the skill of the artist is expressed through the uh, player, the one who is playing the instruments or the one who is singing. Uh, so you can't look at uh, 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 an art piece, you can't look at a painting and say, hey, I don't believe that there is uh, an artist. You know, you don't say that because, well, if there was this art piece, if there was this painting, then there should have been an artist. Similarly, if you listen to a worship song or if you listen to a, a piece of instrumental um, uh, 
you know, uh, song, you don't say, hey, I don't believe that there is an instrumentalist or I don't believe that there is a player who is uh, playing these songs. You know, you don't say that. Uh, even if you're driving a car or a two-wheeler, you don't say, hey, I don't believe that there is, uh, you know, a, a car manufacturer or a two-wheeler manufacturer. You don't say that. In the same way, you know, when we look at creation, uh, creation reveals the invisible attributes of God. And that is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 20. Can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verses 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Amen. So here what Paul is telling uh, the, the uh, Gentiles is those who have become Christians. He's saying you don't have an excuse. Yes, the Jews had, uh, they have their law, they have their prophets, they have their covenants, they're able to know God, you know, but you don't have an excuse, but because look at creation. Creation, Paul says, reveals the invisible attributes of God, or the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in creation and he says that he it can be clearly even understood by the things that are made that there is an eternal power there is an eternal god and there is a godhead so he says that you are without excuse so you know none of them can make an excuse that and god has not left anyone with an excuse to say that there is no existence of god no one can say hey show me god and then i would believe because creation itself reveals to us <coughs> sorry creation itself reveals to us the invisible attributes the eternal power of the godhead and hence people are without excuse so if anyone tells you hey i don't believe in the existence of god you can tell them look at uh, creation and then you can tell them hey if you look at a painting you don't say that there is no artist if you listen to a piece of music you don't say there is no one who's uh, you know a, a vocalist has not sung this or there is no one who is a player who has played this you know there is proof and hence there is uh, we have this piece of art or we have this music piece that is being rendered to us and uh, hence we are without any excuse in the same way you know creation itself reveals to us the invisible attributes of god so in creation uh, we see god's limitless um, unending infinite uh, power and this power was released in creation so None of them are without excuse. And this God who is infinite, you know, we are able to see his infinite attributes in creation. We also know that, you know, uh, God upholds everything that he's created by his word. We've already read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, you know, um, Christ who is the brightness of uh, the glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So everything is in creation that we see is upheld or upheld by the powerful word of God. So the entire universe is being held by the power of his word and God's word is powerful and God's word is still at work in this universe. Amen. And after he created everything that we see in uh, the world, everything that we see in creation, God made man. Okay, so God made Adam and Eve. He created them in his own image. He created them to be part of his own family. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. Now, when uh, we read in Genesis chapter 1 that God created man in his own image and likeness, uh, what do you what comes to your mind any thoughts when scripture tells us in genesis chapter 1 that god created us in his own image and likeness what comes to your mind <coughs> K 
Here we belong to God, okay? We're loved by Him so much, okay? What does it mean by created in His likeness and image? Okay, we have a spiritual image, that is His nature and character, okay? Thank you. Anyone else? There's no discrimination. Okay, there's no discrimination, yes. So when we say that God created us His image and likeness, you know, God is a spirit being. He does not have a form or shape like we do. So, you know, when we say that, uh, you know, hey, you look like your father, you look like your mother, you look like your granddad, you know, it's just that you have same uh, facial resemblance or, you know, your personality kind is the same like the one they're comparing to. But when we're saying that we created God's image and likeness, you know, God has no form or shape like us. He's a spirit being. So it basically means that God is holy. He created us holy. God is sinless. He created us as sinless beings. God is, um, God never dies. He created us never to die. You know, God has a mind where he's able to think and uh, reason, you know, uh, and he gave us, when he created us in his image and likeness, he means that he 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 gave us a mind that we can understand him we can comprehend him or we can know him you know god has god is sovereign he does what he wills that means he has a will and so he gave us as uh, a people whom he created in his own image he gave us a will he gave us a gift of volition the gift to make our own uh, choices to choose and um, you know, so that, uh, and he gave us a mind that we can reason and understand and hear him and know him and relate to him um, as well. So that, this is what it means when God created us in his uh, image and his likeness, okay? Um, but when we know that when Adam and Eve sinned, they plunged the entire human race into sin, uh, into subjection, into Satan and moral decay and corruption, and sin deviated from God's original plan. And God let go of things as it was going. He let go of things. He let go of the world coming to moral degradation and corruption and um, moral decay. Uh, it did not surprise God because, you know, God let it be for a time because he knew that in the Kairos moment, in the appointed time, in the right time, all of this will be delivered back from bondage, um, from corruption, uh, into the original position or the original way that it was uh, uh, created or meant to be. And we know that you know, God let it be. He let it be for some time because he knows he's going to redeem all of creation. He's going to really redeem all of mankind. Everything will be delivered from bondage, from corruption into his glorious, um, uh, into this, its glorious state once again. And he let it be because, you know, this work was already completed or conceived or completed in the heart and mind of God even before uh, it happened, even before the foundation of the world, even before time uh, began. And so Apostle Paul wrote that God gave up everything to corruption in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. We read that. So one of you can turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. So the Apostle Paul wrote that God gave up everything to corruption because he knew he was going to redeem everything back. Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. Can one of you please read that? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Amen.
Thank you, Deepu. So here we see that you know, creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. Okay, God did not just give it up willingly, but because of Him who subjected in hope that you know creation itself will be delivered from bondage of uh, corruption and will be reinstated into its glorious uh, position or the glorious form that God created it to be. And also we, you know, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, uh, who we who are the children of God, we also groan inwardly even as we go through various pains and difficulties and sicknesses and we eagerly await the redemption of our glorious bodies. So even though Adam and Eve sinned and plunged the entire world into sin and corruption, but at the appointed time, the eternal word became flesh and dwelled among us, and he paid the redemption price, and he delivered us from sin, Satan, and uh, from death. Okay, so at the appointed time, at the Kairos moment, the Godhead decided to uh, unveil their plan of sending the Son of God and the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us. As we have read already in John chapter 1, verses 14 and 34, in verse 14 it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 34 says, and we have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Okay, So the one who was equal with the Father, was one who was equal with the Holy Spirit, decided to come to the earth as a man and walk as the Son of God. God. So the eternal word became the Son of God. The infinite, eternal God, omnipotent one, you know, he laid aside all of that and he chose to become like one amongst us, one like us, uh, and he chose to come and, um, you know, contain himself, uh, uh, you know, uh, take on a human body, become a human being and live among us and fulfill the plan that the Godhead had conceived even before the foundation of the world. So what did the Son of uh, God do, uh, e e e even as he became uh, the Son of Man, even as he, um, uh, even as the eternal word became flesh, we will look at uh, a few things as the Son of God did. We're not going to look at his uh, the science, miracles, and wonders, but we will just uh, look at the, the 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 things that we've already studied about his virgin birth, about his uh, uh, you know what he did on the cross, the redemption price that he paid, and um, what it all means to us. So we see that this uh, eternal word who became uh, the eternal word, the son of God, who became the son of man, he limited himself to being a human being and was born of a virgin Mary. Okay, we already read Luke chapter 1 verses 34 and 35 where uh, uh, Mary comes to the angel uh, and tells her that she is going to, um, you know, uh, uh, have a son. And uh, Mary asked the angel in verse 34, how can this be? Because I do not know any man. And 35, the angel answered and said to her that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and the power of the highest will overshadow her. And uh, the Holy One who is to be born in her will be called the Son of God. Okay, so, sorry. Sorry, I'm having a bad chest infection. So the one who is to be born in her will be called the Son of God. Okay, so we look at what the Son of God did even as he limited himself to a human being, was born of a virgin, and what he did and how he accomplished the plan that the God had conceived even before the foundations of the world. Now, if you look at scripture, Bible contrasts um, a man who he created in his image with the Son of God, a few passages that we have. The Bible contrasts the first Adam uh, with... 
Sorry, Asapu. So the Bible contrasts the first Adam with the Son of God. Uh, the Bible refers to Adam as in the scriptures. If you read Paul's writings in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, the uh, Bible refers to Adam as the first Adam, the first man, and the natural man. And in contrast, you know, contrasting Adam to the Son of God, the Son of Man, you know, um, refers to Jesus as the last Adam. So Adam was the first Adam. Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. The Adam was referred to as the first man. Jesus is referred to as the second man. And um, Adam was referred to as the natural man. And Jesus was referred to as the heavenly man. Okay, so I'll explain this and you'll understand. So the first Adam was created with the intent uh, to be the prototype a prototype means first of the kind, uh, similar, uh, you know, uh, a pattern, an example. So the first Adam was created at, with the intent to be the prototype for the rest of mankind. But we know that when Adam sinned and um, and fell, you know, this prototype that was created in the image and the likeness of God became defective and tarnished. And so God said, or the God had already conceived that they will send another prototype. And this prototype is called as the last Adam or the second man. Why second man? Because the first man uh, was, was who was to be the uh, prototype, the, was created with the intent to be the prototype for the rest of mankind. You know, he became defective and tarnished. And as a result, all of us, you know, uh, in the preceding generations were also born in sin. And so God said, I will send another prototype, you know, and this prototype is the son of God. Like, just like Adam is also called the son of man, you know, Jesus is called the son of God. And that is why he took on this whole um uh, this title, I think, of Son of God, just to, uh, to identify with us being Son of Men, um, a Son of Man, and, you know, he becoming the perfect prototype. Uh, the prototype is the last Adam, and the Bible says that we don't need another one, um, and so the Bible refers to Son of God as the last Adam. Okay, so we have the first Adam, who is Adam himself, and then we have the last Adam as Jesus. And what does it mean by being the last Adam? Why is Jesus referred to as the last Adam? Because he is the 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 prototype of all who will, you know, be called uh, sons and daughters, all who will be part of the family of God, and uh, who will experience eternal life, and who will be reinstated to their original. Uh, image of being created in the image and the likeness of God and uh, having that spiritual image, so to say. So uh, the Son of God, you know, be, uh, uh, the God had decided to send Jesus as a Son of God, uh, uh, who would be another prototype, and this prototype is the last Adam. So if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45, and verses 47 to 48. So one of you can please read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 and verses 47 to 48, please. And so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a living, life-giving spirit. Verse 47 and 48 also, please. Verse 47. The first man was the earth and made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as it, as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Amen. Thank you. So here it says that the first man, Adam, became a living being, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, which means, you know, a, a, a eternal a life that we have in Christ Jesus. The first man was from where? From the earth. So he's uh, called as the natural man. 
The second man, which is referring to the Son of God, Jesus himself, is the Lord from heaven, and so we refer him to as the heavenly man. Verse 48 says, as the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust, just like we are the prototype of the first Adam, you know, uh, and is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly, which means that those who are born again are no longer now, you know, part of the prototype of the first Adam, the first man, the natural man, but now we take on the, uh, the, the, the nature of the last Adam, the second man, and the heavenly man, that is Jesus Christ. So those who are born again, here it says, you know, we become part of the kingdom of God. We are heavenly citizens. We're no longer earthly citizens. So this is another wonderful spiritual blessing that we have received. I think in the uh, in the last uh, previous classes, one of you asked uh, the question, what are the spiritual inheritance or what are the spiritual blessings we've received? And this is one of them. So. We have the first Adam, the last Adam, the first man, the second man, the natural man, and the heavenly man. So the first Adam was created, so it was a created being, um, uh, created uh, to be uh, as a son of God. We were created initially to be uh, sons and daughters of God. That was what our identity was. But when this, uh, you know, but when um, Adam and Eve sin we became slaves of uh, satan um, and we no longer had we lost that identity but the last adam was the incarnate god who walked as the son of god and he is the last adam and he and there is go going to be no one else after him or like him and so also those who believe in him, those who believe in the Son of God, you know, become part of this family of God. We will, we will also be called sons and daughters of God, and we will also have the divine nature in us, and we also have the hope of eternal life. So the first man, Adam, he failed, he sinned, he lost all that was given to him, he sold it away, he gave it away to Satan, but the second man, Jesus Christ, also the, uh, the last Adam, the heavenly man, obeyed God, who was without sin. And uh, when he paid the price on the cross, he recovered all that the first man or the, uh, the first Adam had lost. So we see that, you know, um, uh, just like the first man was a natural man, earthly, the second man was also heavenly man. He lived from up down. We live from down up, but he came and he lived from up down. And uh, the second man obeyed God, was without sin, and recovered everything that the first Adam or the first man lost. Amen? Okay. So we look at... How did the Son of God walk on the earth? How did this, uh, how did the last Adam, how did the second man, how did the heavenly man, you know, how did he walk on the earth? Before that, anyone has any questions, any doubts? <coughs> any questions, any doubts? All of you with me in class? Okay, if there are no questions and no doubts, we'll move on. We look at how the Son of God walked on the earth. Okay, we see that when the Son of God walked on the earth, we've already studied most of this, it's just kind of reiterating the points. The Son of God revealed the Father to us. Okay, we uh, read this in John chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 14 and verse 18. We've already looked at these scripture passages, so we're not going to read it. But John chapter 1, verse 1 says, The beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and this Word became flesh, verse 14, and He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him to us. So we uh, I explained what is the meaning of the bosom of the Father, which means that uh, only Jesus could reveal the Father to us because he was one with the Father, and he was very intimate and close in his relationship with the Father. And hence, he himself could reveal or declare the Father to us. We also uh, studied that, you know, the Son of God is the is exact image of the Father. John chapter 14, verse 8 and verse 9. When Philip asked Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that is sufficient for us. And what does Jesus say? You know, um, I've been so long with you, Philip, but you've not known me. And then he says, he who has seen me has also seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the uh, Father? So in Jesus, we see the, uh, the, uh, the exact representation of the image of the Godhead. We see and we can know God the Father and we can experience um, uh, the tangible presence, the, uh, the, the nature and the reality of who God the Father is. We also studied in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that Jesus, sorry, so sorry. We also studied in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So in Jesus, we see the invisible uh, image of God, or we can know the Father, we can know his attributes and his nature. Okay. What else do we know about the Son of God, even as he walked on the earth? The Son of God, we know, walked in uh, the intimate presence of the Father, uh, John chapter 1, verse 18, which I've already mentioned to you just now, and uh, John chapter 10, verse 15. So can one of you please read John chapter 10, verse 15, please? John 10, 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, Amen. So here we see that the Son of God walked in the intimate presence of the Father. That means the Son of God and God the Father were very intimate. Uh, so he says here, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. Another area where uh, the Son of God, uh, how the Son of God walked on the earth was the Son of God rested in the Father's love. Okay. Um, can one of you please read John chapter 3, verse 35, and someone else can read John chapter 17, verse 24, please. John 3, 35, and John 17, 24. John chapter 3, yes. verses 35. The Father loves the Son, and he has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. Amen. So here we see that the Son of God rests in the Father's love. John 17, 24. Someone else? Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may be behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. So here we see that, thank you, we see that, you know, um, the son was loved by the father so they had uh, a very intimate relationship and the son of god rested in the father's love the son of god also walked in obedience to the father uh, john chapter 4 verse 34 and uh, hebrews 10 7 and 9 so can two of you read that please john 4 34 and hebrews 10 7 and 9 4 34 jesus said to them my food is to be do the will of him who sent me and and to finish his work amen so here we see that what does jesus say it is his will to do the father's will and to finish his work that means jesus was completely obedient to the father hebrews 10 7 and 9 please hebrews 10 7 to 9 
Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that Jesus had come to do the will of the Father. So even as Jesus walked on the earth, the Son of God walked in total obedience to the Father, doing the will of the Father. And the Son of God also walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 4 and Acts chapter 10 verse 38. So can some of you please read that please? Romans 1 4, Acts 10 38. Romans 1 4. Romans 1 4. Go ahead, Warren. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Deepu. Yeah, no problem. Uh, uh, and who, through the Spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So here we see that, you know, uh, the Son of God walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was raised from the dead. Acts 10, 38. Deepu, you would like to read that? Yes, ma'am. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Amen. Amen. So here we see that, um, you know, Jesus not only was risen from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, but we also see that, you know, he went about healing and uh, delivering people, uh, those who were oppressed from the, by the devil uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you all able to hear me clearly? Okay, thank you. We also see that when Jesus walked on the, on the earth, uh, he, you know, the Son of God destroyed the works of the devil. Okay, John chapter 1 verse 38. Uh, someone else can read Matthew 8, 29. And someone else can read Mark 3, 11. So the Son of God, when he was here on the earth, he destroyed the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Someone else can read Matthew 8, 29. And someone else can read Mark 3, 11. One John three eight, please. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Amen. Thank you, Warren. So it says here, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. And we see that even when Jesus was ministering on the earth here, you know, demons trembled and shivered and were in fear of him. We uh, can, someone read Matthew 8, 29, and someone else can read Matthew 3, 11, please. Matthew 8, 29, and suddenly they cried out, saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Amen. Thank you, Lucy. Mark 3.11. Can I read, ma'am? Sure, please. And whenever the unclean spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Deepu. So here we see that the demons trembled and shivered and were fear uh, with the very presence of the Son of God. God. We also see that the Son of God, you know, uh, withstood every temptation. Uh, uh, we know uh, in Matthew chapter 4 how he withstood the temptation. I think that is just one of the temptations mentioned there and then in the Garden of Gethsemane. But I'm sure Jesus faced many other temptations. But, you know, uh, just particularly looking at Matthew chapter 4, where Satan even questioned his sonship. 
in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, it says that when the tempter had come to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And verse 6, again, he says, you know, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Uh, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So even uh, when Jesus was walking on the earth, um, you know, Satan questioned even his sonship, or he, he even tempted him in this area of su his sonship. But we see that the Son of God withstood every temptation, and he was sinless without any uh, sin. We also see that Jesus Christ declared that he was the Son of uh, God. Um, uh, can one of you read uh, John 10, 36, and someone else can read Luke 22, verse 70, please? Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? Amen. Thank you. Can someone else read uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 70? Amen. Luke 22, verse 70. And they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. So here we see Jesus himself, you know, attesting to the fact or confirming. Uh, saying that he is the Son of God. I am the Son of God. You rightly say that I am. Even his disciples received a revelation of him being the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 and uh, 17, Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And what does Simon Peter reply? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what does Jesus tell him? Um, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So the Father is revealed through the Holy Spirit to Simon Peter that uh, this Christ or this Jesus is the Son of the living God. Okay. We also see that on the earth, the Son of God completed his work of redemption. Um, uh, we know that Jesus, even as he was the second man, you know, who never sinned. And uh, as a second man, as the last Adam, he could represent the rest of the humankind on the cross because he was sinless, but he was like one of us. And he took upon himself our failures. The first man subjected us to, slay, to be slaves of sin, uh, of death, and of Satan. But the second man, you know, he liberated us through his work of redemption on the cross so when jesus died on the cross you know he paid for the sins of the whole world he paid the redemption price he redeemed us he completed the work of redemption and he alone was qualified to do this because he was god who had become man so god's plan of the ages was now being unfolded in the son of God or through the Son of God. And that's why Paul wrote, if the prince of this world would know the plan, they would have not crucified the Lord. They would have tried to stop this plan. And hence, Jesus kept this whole plan as a mystery. So when Jesus died on the cross, Satan and uh, his demonic forces thought, hey, you know, we accomplished our plan. We are victorious. We are, uh, we, we've won. Uh, but they were, you know, oblivious to the uh, to this fact of the plan of God. The plan of God was a mystery. They did not know this plan that was conceived in the heart and mind of the Godhead even before the foundation of the world, and even the plan of redemption. But when Jesus rose from the dead, you know, um, and when the Son of God paid the redemption price, we see that. Uh, and he was raised through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was raised back to life. Then God said, now I will reveal my mysteries. I will reveal my secrets. And he began to reveal the secrets and the mystery to the church. And we know that the early apostles wrote about this. And they said that this is what God was doing all along. And now you and I, you know, partake in this plan for the ages. Isn't that wonderful that the Son of God died, he paid the redemption price, 
he was raised back to life like we read in john Ch uh, romans chapter sorry romans chapter 1 verse 4 that uh, you know uh, paul writes and declared to be the son of god with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead so he was resurrected from the dead and when this whole plan of redemption was completed when jesus died paid the redemption price he rose up from the dead then god said i will reveal my secrets i will reveal the plan that we had in the garden in uh, before the foundation of the world before the ages before time began i will begin to reveal the secrets to the church and he began to reveal this and the early apostles wrote about this and uh, it was said that, uh, and they said that this was what God was doing all along. Now you and I get to partake in this plan for the ages. Amen. Isn't that beautiful that we in this new covenant, we who are part of uh, the church of God are so privileged to know and receive the mysteries or understand the mysteries that was conceived in the Godhead even before the foundation of the world we'll continue in the next class anyone has any questions sorry we've kind of run out of time but anyone has any questions uh what is it better to say last adam rather than second man why why don't you want to say second man somewhere it doesn't correlate with being firstborn yeah, he's, uh, oh, you mean that uh, second man. The second man is actually born from heaven, is from heaven. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? He was not born through the natural process of con uh, 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 of a person being conceived. And so, sec oh, you mean it's a, a more uh, 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 derogatory term or secondary term, that's what you mean, compared to the first man. Well, the first man uh, failed, but the second man, you know, be, uh, of who we are, the prototype, uh, redeemed everything. And the second man who obeyed God and was without sin. So it's good to say second man because, you know, he identified as a man. And the second man because he was not natural but heavenly. Did that help? Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Anyone has any other questions? Okay, there are no questions. Thank you everyone. Uh, have a good weekend, a blessed weekend. I'll see you next class. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Get well soon. Thank you, Warren.